Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Big warm hugs for you, or cool hugs if you're in a heat wave. Thanks to all of you, including Matt Zaglin, Kelly Cook, Scott Hepburn, and everybody. Welcome our new patron, Julio! Yay! Julio's Julio, Julio. On this episode of DTNS... Now might be the time to ditch Google or Microsoft for Proton. Plus, teachers use generative models for grading papers. Is that a good idea? And why translucent gadgets are in. Everybody loves transparency, you know? <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, the 3rd of July, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, where I can't even believe it's 3rd of July, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Happy 3rd of July, everyone. Yeah. Happy Woo-hoo. 3rd of July to you as well. Yeah. We have got a show packed full of the exact technology news you need to help understand the world around you. Shall we commence? Yeah. I'm ready. All right. Agreed. Let's start with the quick hits. On Wednesday, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced the company's social network Threads now has more than 175 million monthly active users, although it didn't disclose daily active user numbers, and that can be a little bit different when figuring out trends of who's using what and when. This is almost almost exactly Threads' one-year anniversary. It first launched in the Apple App Store on July 5th, 2023. Gosh. It's only been a year. The Verge's Alex Heath says that Meta employees have told him in recent months that a good portion of Thread's growth is still coming from it being promoted inside Instagram Mm. and that Meta execs are considering turning on ads in Thread's sometime in 2025. Oh, so we got the rest of this year to enjoy it ad free. All right. Uh, Meta also introduced something called Meta 3D Gen Wednesday. It's a system to create high quality 3D assets from a text description. You tell it what it wants to make and it makes a 3D model for you. So you're doing a video game, some industrial development, architecture, whatever you want to do. Uh, get, get rid of those CAD designers and just do it with Meta 3D Gen. Uh, there's Meta 3D Asset Gen, which creates 3D meshes. Uh, another one called Texture Gen, which generates textures. And together, these can produce 3D assets with high-resolution textures and physically-based rendering materials. PBR materials. PBR me. ASAP with Meta 3D Gen. Meta says the process is three to ten times faster than existing models that do similar things. If you didn't know that Alphabet had a robo-agriculture startup called Mineral, you wouldn't be alone. But Alphabet is apparently abandoning that effort, reportedly due to industry competition and slim profit margins. But Mineral's autonomous plant buggies, as they're known, might find a new home through licenses with former industry partnerships. Bloomberg reports that Alphabet may license some of its farming technology to Driscoll's. That's a berry producer, as in physical berries that you just eat out of a box uh, (laughs) that spent the last few years working with autonomous plant buggies that Mineral was apparently also using to study crops and soil and other environmental factors. I ate Driscoll's blueberries this morning. So did I. Yeah. They're They're wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman has a source that tells him that Apple's Phil Schiller has been given an observer role on OpenAI's board. He'll just lurk around in the back while everyone's doing their... No, it's 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 a, actually a role that Microsoft has a person that holds as well. Uh, it just basically means they get to attend the board meetings and listen in on the conversation, but they can't vote. vote. They're, they don't have the same power as a full-fledged director. Uh, Phil Schiller is the head of Apple's App Store and also its former marketing chief. Uh, so he will be able to attend board meetings, but Again, not able to vote or exercise any of the other director powers. Just be able to push people a certain way. Just lurk. <laughs> yeah. Lurk. I'm just, I'm just looking over your shoulder. Why? Why are you going to yeah. vote that way? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just an observer. Is that yeah. weird? Do you not like me doing that? <laughs> Google announced in its 2024 environmental report on Tuesday that emissions related to data center, uh, center energy consumption and supply chain emissions and rapid advancements in and around demand for artificial intelligence rose almost 50% compared to 2019. The report also noted that the company's total data data center electricity consumption grew 17% in 2023. Overall emissions also increased 13% year over year. 
Google previously stated its goal is to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. So, given uh, the you know the 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 data demand at this point, we might have its work cut out for it. Mm, good luck with that. There's also a story kicking around out there about uh, AWS and others doing direct negotiations with nuclear power plants to just oh, wow. get get the energy direct from the source. Mm, mm-hmm. Well, um, speaking of energy that you might be into, Proton just launched an online collaborative document service called Proton Docs. You'll be able to access it through the Proton Drive service. That's free, up to five gigabytes, and unlimited inv- individual plans for 9.99 euros. Now, family and business plans are also available. If this sounds like Google Docs, that's because it is. It's exactly like Google Docs. Well, it's not exactly like Google Docs, but it's very, 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 very much going for the Google Docs market. Like everything from Proton, Proton Docs is end-to-end encrypted in real time, offering real-time collaborative editing, comments, sharing, multimedia support, works on the web, optimized for desktop. Proton says it'll add more features over time and plans to have all the features that Google Docs currently offers eventually. Code for Proton Docs will be open source too for independent security audits. Now, Proton I'm a big Mail fan of- started, you know, back in the day, and uh, yeah, has 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 many fans. So this feels like a pretty obvious expansion. Yeah, it does. Uh, Proton is really expanding to fulfill on its promise of privacy. So if people don't understand what Proton does, uh, it is recently, just as of April, uh, majority owned by a nonprofit foundation. So this is similar to what how Mozilla uh, is created, or Signal is operated this way. Uh, OpenAI is actually still operated this way, although they're talking about changing to be for-profit. But the nonprofit foundation majority owns Proton. Proton itself is for-profit, so that it has some of those in, in you know in incentives uh, to improve its product, but the overall foundation under Swiss law is required to emphasize and prioritize customer privacy above all because that's in its charter. Uh, we have a similar thing in the U.S. called a public benefit company. Uh, that's not exactly the same, but it, but it's somewhat close. Where you you say I'm committed to this principle. That's what the company is going to do first and foremost above everything else. All right. So Tom this morning convinced me to do a thing. He came on the morning stream, stream like he does on Wednesdays, and we do a little tech segment. And during this segment, he informed me about this, this addition to the Proton services. Now, I'd never heard of Proton. Don't know why. I just hadn't. I confused it with the, the game layer thing that, that Steam makes. And uh, I was surprised this even existed. I've been looking for something like this. It's priced right where I need it. I, I signed up immediately for it. And I really like the idea of um, end-to-end encryption on all of these kinds of services. But I also didn't know they provided like full email domain stuff. And there are business plans that work really well for small businesses, which might actually be the tier I end up with. Um, Mm. I would really like it, though, Tom Merritt, if they had spreadsheets ready to go. Because spreadsheets are a huge part of my workflow every day and not in the way people think. And I think you can commiserate. Well, I know we can because we're looking at them right now for the show. We're staring at Google Sheets right now as we talk. Yeah, we use these spreadsheets in ways that, you know, perhaps uh, the universe didn't intend, but they're really good at what we need them for. So if these guys get to that point um, and, and end up having, you know, robust support for both this document service and spreadsheets... I may that may be one less Google thing I ever use again. And it's not just an ideologues product. This product is becoming capable for business for small businesses, capable for individuals for sure. Adding things like docs make us want them to add sheets so that we can say I want to pay a company for their product not be the product and also pay the company for the product, which you know, a lot of times with Google and Microsoft, you also have to do that. And you're also the product. Uh, this is the key to having this be a nonprofit foundation owned company. Uh, they are committed to not using your information for anything. Everything is end to end encrypted. And particularly what Sarah said, 
the source is opened so that people can look at it and make sure that there's nothing in there that would cause a leak of your information. Or if there is, they can fix it right away. But it's it's independently verified. Um, I have a pretty good board of trustees as well. So the board of trustees for the foundation include Tim Berners-Lee. You guys heard of Sir Tim yeah. Berners-Lee? Yeah. 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 Uh, His name gets he, he made the web, you know. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Yeah, and kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard of it. Uh, Dr. Andy Yen is a fellow CERN scientist of Tim Berners-Lee, who is the CEO of Proton. Uh, Ding Chao Lu is Proton's first employee, so he's been working on it since they started mail. Uh, and then the other two board members are Anton. Antonio Gambardella, which is direct, he is the director of the nonprofit Fongit, whose mission is to support innovation and economic development responsibly. Uh, and then Professor Carissa Valies, a professor in ethics at the Institute of Ethics in AI at the University of Oxford. She's a leading expert on privacy issues. So if I were to pick five people to run Proton's foundation, I, I don't know that I could come up with five better people than that. Yeah, you know, the the only when Proton Mail first launched uh, a couple years ago, I, you know, fooled around with it uh, at, because we were going to talk about it on the show, which we did and was like, yeah, it's great. But it was, it, you know, it, it's sort of a hard sell to get me off of Gmail just because I use Gmail for kind of everything. And I have several Gmail email addresses and they all, you know, work in tandem. Um, well, and I feel like this is this is the same sort of thing. It's like if you if you care about the ethics that Proton uh, is setting forth, awesome. I think this is a really really great alternative to you know Microsoft Office, Google Docs, and you know that's kind of it, right? I mean that's that's the market that they're going after. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody's going to care about this stuff, but if you do. Well, all right. Here you go. They also offer a VPN, which Google no longer does. Ah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's true. There's a there's a, a suite of dagger in there. suite of mm -hmm. features that, um, and I pride myself on knowing about these things usually. But I was I didn't know they existed. Maybe the only problem they have right now is like a PR problem, and then start stacking features, and before you know it, these guys are like a a massive player in security, uh, privacy, and usability and functionality. And I would love to support somebody like that yeah uh well let's talk a little bit about a wall street journal article from sarah rendazzo called that essay got a b plus an ai bot graded it programs can give students feedback faster than teachers but some critics say ai shouldn't be used to grade uh i know it's really interesting to me that the most popular story in our survey that we did this year is AI, and the least popular story in the survey that we did this year was also AI, uh, which tells me that you folks like an AI story if it's different and non-repetitive and useful and interesting, and I think this one qualifies. Uh, teachers have been using some products that are trained specifically for class grading uh, to assist them in grading papers. Now, I don't think ma the majority of them, certainly not most of them, are just using the bot and then entering the grade. In fact, all of the companies recommend against that. They say this should be used as an assistance. Some of the teachers, though, are passing the feedback from the bot directly to the students. Some are not. Some think that the bot's feedback is a little harsh and they want to make it kinder. A lot of them talk about how there's nuance that a human can bring to the evaluation that the bot just can't. So they, they want to use the bot as a starting point to say, oh, those are good points. That speeds things up. It does a lot of the tedious things like the answers, like especially in math where it's clearly wrong or right. Uh, but they generally offer to generate a numeric score and critiques on things like sentences, arguments, other elements. Uh, Class Companion is one of these. Uh, it notes that teachers can improve the model by overriding the evaluations and thus training it so that it gets better. And Magic School AI intentionally does not develop ways for its product to give a grade. Uh, they're actively discouraging teachers from Just using, giving notes, using it that basically. way. Yeah, yeah. They're basically saying this is to help you evaluate things faster. A lot of the teachers are saying that they feel like other teachers are mad at them for liking these tools, but they find them useful because it allows them to spend more time with the student helping them rather than spending time doing the tedious stuff. 
Yeah, I feel like this is um, whether well, whatever. To me, this is a sign of where we're headed. But also, that's a job that could use a little less tedium and a little more one-on-one sort of inspirational sort of human-to-human stuff. So um, I don't know. I don't find this terribly uh, concerning. Um, not that everything about AI has to have the angle of, oh my gosh, we better be concerned before we're anything else, but although it generally does, but yeah, it generally it doesn't, does it doesn't have to, yeah. right. It doesn't have to. Um, but I think in this particular case, like everyone's always wondering what will be the practical impacts, not just the fear factors of, will it take our jobs or will it, you know, destroy uh, yeah. an industry or something like that. Instead, sometimes it's just, I don't have to sit there and grade papers all night. Yeah. Instead, and I can think I've about heard, Billy who needs help and I can be one on one with Billy and take care of some stuff that I, he needs long term. I've definitely heard from more than one teacher that the one of the least favorite parts of their job is grading. Mm-hmm. Right. And especially the tedious grading, you know, the marking correct, incorrect, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that stuff, I, I'm sure that they're already, I mean, they're already testing systems that do this. Right. They're, uh, we've been doing that for a long time where, you know, uh, back in the day when I was in school, I would, uh, punch cards or use a number two pencil and uh, fill in the little Oh, yeah, the, and, the bubble test, dot yeah. test, whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. those would this, be fed into a like machine. This is like way better than that, though, because this can better. do essays, and yeah. those was could that not. that Stangram or something? Whatever that was called, yeah. Dan, but Dan the point Stan is, if they felt or, like yeah. that was okay, I don't know why this wouldn't be okay. Dan, this, is, this is just another This is just another extension well, in that uh, direction, right? So, Scantron. Scantron. Thank you. Scantron. Thank you. Gosh, that was going to, that would have taken me a while. I think that we all, you know, as as people who have been through uh, various uh, um, uh, scholastic systems, you yeah. know, there is always that teacher where you're like, that was a gr- that teacher was my favorite teacher. Mm-hmm. They cared so much. They tried so hard. Not every teacher I have felt that way about, even though it's a hard job. My dad was an elementary school teacher. Um, I know how hard it is, uh, especially, you know, w- you know, with kids who um, are struggling a little bit. So this kind of thing, yeah, to help a teacher be the best teaching version of themselves, if they genuinely like their job and, you know, want to, want to, you know, you know, uh, instill knowledge into, you know, the students that they're teaching. I think this is great. I think this is awesome. Mm -hmm. If you're, and if you're a good teacher, you know, you can't just be like, eh, AI, tell me the grade. No, you use the notes and then you, you know, inform yourself. And like you said, Tom, uh, it could, uh, it, it could help a teacher from experiencing, too much burnout from grading papers all night every yeah. day. The other thing, too, is there is a uh, – as somebody who almost became an art teacher, I was this close at one point in my life, um, there's, a th- there's a lot going on right now with AI and image recognition, not just reproduction or whatever, but seeing images and picking things out and denoting certain stuff. I think even art teachers who are looking for mm. everybody to do a collage, and that collage needs to include these five or six factors – to be able to have sure. uh, a model look at that and go, yeah, kid A through Z got all the uh, got everything we asked for, but this kid and this kid didn't. Um, I mean, even in those cases, you're saving time. And saved time for a teacher isn't downtime. It's time with the kid. It's time working yeah. on better plans. It's all of that. And I, I think it's improving the educational to, experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree with uh, that. Stealth Dave says, I think encouraging kids to have AI review their homework before turning it in is a good idea. Uh, some teachers are doing that. Remember, I said some teachers are like, I think it's a little harsh to give the feedback directly. I want to modify it. Some teachers are, and I think they're older students, allowing the students to see the feedback directly. And some of the students said, I like that because then I can modify my work and before improve I get faster the grade. because I'm getting faster feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Really interesting stuff. Well, we want your feedback, so uh, you don't have to be a chatbot to do it. You can just get in touch with us on social networks at DTNS Show on X, uh, at DTNS Show at MSTDN.social on Mastodon, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and at DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram and Threads. Say hi. The Verge recently put together a list of news stories highlighting technology housed in transparent plastic. You're like, what? Yeah, you know, you know the kind. It's the computer where you can see the innards. 
It's uh, it, it, it's that sort of thing. So think original IMAX in their translucent candy-colored plastic cases or the clear Game Boy that was released back in 1997. Now, Scott, there seems to be a little bit of a resurgence of this. What's old is new again. So what is about transparent aesthetics that seems to be, I don't know, making a comeback? Well, um, you are starting to see a bit of a comeback here. Part of it is all the 90s kids are at a disposable income age, and also, you know, the world is full of technology. I think they miss those days of a little clear Tamagotchi where you could see all the parts inside or their Game Boy Advance that, you know, f folded over the SP model and you could see all the little parts inside. Um, but also you could do a lot with color, and you saw it across the board. Even Apple was making iMacs and iBooks around 97, 98 that... You know, you could see through. Uh, they certainly were not the only ones uh, doing that, but it became very mainstream for a while, and then poof, kind of kind of went away. Um, and it was a bit of a reaction to the beige nightmare we had all been dealing with for a while there, I think. <laughs> right. um, so yeah. it was nice. It was a nice change. It was like, oh, okay, also, we can be colorful. You know, when it comes to the IMAX, it was sort of like you can kind of see components. It wasn't like no. totally translucent. Yeah, not the exactly. The way some stuff is now. Yeah, not a, there's little opacity to it. I think that was probably on purpose design-wise. But um, And most of them are like this. I remember having an N64, Nintendo 64, back in the day. It was a special edition one that was purple. And you could see in it not super well, but it was enough to know that you there was a skeletal electrical structure to this device. And it had a kind of a mystique to it. And then this stuff sort of started disappearing. Um, now, the rise with retro gaming has, I think, in part, helped this. There are devices from Ambernick and a, and a few other makers where they have leaned into this transparency stuff. I have a device right here. In fact, you can't see this at home, listener, but those watching video, it's sort of translucent. You can see the guts in that mm, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, that's cool looking. Yeah, and that, I picked this one for that reason. They have other opaque models, and I was like, no, give me the, give me the see-through one. Um, I think it's... It's time. I think we should get more of this stuff going on. There is certainly an ongoing fascination with just about anybody when they see a device of any kind, a television even, um, like even just a, you know, a big flat screen TV. There are still electronic components there. There are still boards in there. There's still you know, all these little points of articulation. And when you see that stuff, there's something magical about it. I don't know if it's that it's letting us know that there's stuff in there and it isn't as simple as just you're turning on a TV. It takes some of the magic away by adding a little magic in a, in a funny way of saying it. Yeah. Um, but I think we're going to start seeing phones with these options. I wouldn't be surprised if both, uh, you know, possibly Google or uh, Android-based phones dive into this a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised if Apple had an option for an upcoming phone. The problem is but these I mean, are usually the plastic. Option be because once you need to use the screen you can't have that see-through stuff or it's going to get messy well it's really the rest of it right and part of this means you're going to have to have plastic or some other material where there's translucency <laughs> if i take an iphone this is a 14 pro if i uh, max pro if i have this thing and 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 can picture what they would do if this was like some sort of transparent uh -huh. uh, material, yeah. your screen doesn't change. I mean, your screen is still opaque, uh, flat, and whatever. Yeah. But so the rest of this, it's like, ooh, the here's yeah. the M4 chip, and I can kind of see where the little GPU camera bits are and all that other stuff. Like, there's something to that. Now, I don't know that they will for sure, but they certainly have a history of it, and they might. They probably won't. <laughs> they probably won't. I mean, yeah, you're talking I mean, about that, they could do... If, they if did I were like a an, betting man, I'd say, no way, Apple's doing this. But this is also... It's the, the, the idea that you can have a bunch of components in a, you know, overall uh, bag or box uh, that you can see is actually a fashion thing these days. Mm -hmm. You've got, yeah. you know, people walking around with like, you know, little, you know, backpacks or, or handbags where you can see what's in their bag. I don't get it myself. And maybe it's because I'm just too much of an old lady. But uh, but you you see it around. You see it a lot at airports. Yeah. A lot at airports. There's something about like having a carry on bag where everything can be seen. And maybe the person uh, holding that bag actually gets something out of it. It's not just like a fashion thing. We've learned from technology reporter extraordinaire Tom Merritt. I learned anyway that <laughs> a lot of big events, arena events, sporting events, that sort of thing, that they want you to have transparent bags which sounded crazy right. oh, they so require they make sure that you you're can't not get, you can't get in, in there. Yeah. yeah 
most concerts and sporting events these days, you you cannot enter the arena or the stadium unless you have your stuff in a small plastic bag uh, mm. that is that that is see through. Um, this is just this is just the cycle, though, right? Like we go beige to black to silver to white to transparent, and and then the order changes, but they they come and go. Don't forget, we saw transparent TVs mm-hmm. at CES. Remember? Yeah, that's right. Like, yes, that that should have been that's the right. uh, the bell ringer that the that the transparent trend was on the rise. Yeah, a little bit. Like just the idea that that there's some nostalgia for this is not surprising. If if I'm I would never come into this episode and say. Get ready for permanent, translucent everything, folks. That isn't going to happen. This will be another trend. It will probably come and go, um, and that's fine. You know, the one thing we haven't seen a resurgence of is ugly beige computers, and I'm thrilled about that. <laughs> you know, and that's great. It's coming. Before, before you oh, please, said that, no. Scott, I never really thought about I mean, I know that the some, you know, colors companies started to get uh, uh, creative with, with different colored things, but... For, for, I don't know, since I was a little kid and we had the first like family computer in the house till I was well out of college, never really thought about it. I just yeah. thought beige they is all coming have back. to be beige. Yeah. <laughs> They're coming back. I'm just you telling you, so? it's a matter Tom's, of time, Tom's Scott. Calling Get it. ready. All right. He's back. Yeah. Yeah. Tom is calling it right now. We will see Within beige Within five come years, back. Scott will be going, oh, I can't believe beige is back. <laughs> For we'll whatever go back reason. to this episode and you can prove it to me. But until then, I feel yeah, pretty Yeah, please confident. remind us as soon as that happens. All sure. right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Longtime listener Russell wrote in and said, every time I hear an AI story where people are complaining about AI creating images or music similar to existing things, isn't that exactly what people do and why copyright exists? Russell says, mm-hmm. those same people learned their craft by looking at or listening to others' art. This is exactly what AI is doing. In fact, people look and listen to things that are not publicly available. But all of those life experiences contribute to their art. Do they credit and pay every artist that may have influenced their art? They may even create something and consider not releasing it because it resembles some someone else's art. It's the responsibility and liability of the prompt generator to determine whether to release something AI generated to the public, not the AI itself. Like Photoshop, it's a tool. It can create forgery, art, AI is just another tool. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Russell. It's very similar. However... Uh, I think enough people take exception to their work being used to train models that even though you're right, even if you are right, and even if the the courts agree that you're right and say, yes, this is a fair use, I think we need to have new rules. I think we need to have new laws that that make it so that people feel better that they are in control of how their work is used. Uh, it's But it's a new thing for the for this because yeah. because in a lot of ways you're right it's not it's not that different but people see yeah. it as different and i think that's worth respecting yeah if a uh, human being by a the top, way could do that oh sorry uh, scott go ahead i was just gonna say if a human being could have you walk up to it and say make me these 300 things in 14 seconds based on a million people's art and you could do that well then i think this has crown to stand on but because other people yeah yeah scale, scale makes a big difference too. scale's yeah, a big part for yeah. sure anyway sorry go ahead uh, this uh, latest top five at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash daily tech news show is about things I predicted wrong. Five things that I predicted that were absolutely wrong. Uh, and Matt writes, you were right about camera phones. Cause one of my predictions is that nobody will ever want a phone in their or camera in their phone. Why would they want a camera in their phone? I was totally wrong. Uh, cameras are in phones all the time. But Matt says, for years, they were garbage. There are people with almost no real pictures of their childhood because almost all of the pictures are grainy three megapixels with a lot of artifacts, (laughs) assuming their parents could find the proprietary cables needed to move the pictures to a PC in the first place. You know, this... Matt makes a very good point. I mean, I wasn't, uh, you know, an infant (laughs) when camera phones first existed. Uh, But, uh, you know, yeah, not the best quality. But you have all these people who are like, oh, yeah, I'll just take photos of, you know, my kid all day. And, you know, not 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 great quality. Kind of reminds me of like the Polaroid fascination when I was like six or seven, where like Mm -hmm. that entire three years of my life were just like, Polaroid photos. Not mm. the greatest resolution. No, but the good news is this. 
I know everyone's sick of AI, but AI is going to be very good at upscaling. So your crummy garbage 240p, crappy digital photos from that era, or even Sarah's scannable uh, Polaroids, they're all going to yeah. look amazing real right now. You could do it now. And and that's one actually one use case of AI that I'm absolutely in love with because you can do some real amazing stuff to old crappy photos. Gosh, the Polaroid sound. I I can hear it right now. <laughs> you can you hear know. it now. Rear, rear, rear. Yeah. Oh, just just lovely. Love stuff. you, Polaroid, even though crappy, crappy quality. Uh, we also love you, Scott Johnson. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. We got a big show planned for Friday uh, for CORE. And you might say, Wayne, it's not usually on Thursdays. It is. But because of the national holiday of the 4th, we will not be having it that day. So instead, I will recommend people check it out on Friday. We're going to have a lot to talk about, a bunch of new games to discuss. We're in the middle of the Steam summer sale, which is a monstrous thing that we spend way too much money on. Uh, for games that we'll probably never play. So uh, come tune in and check that out. That's on Friday. Uh, you can find it uh, all the details at frogpants.com slash core. And, folks, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. If you're a patron, you get more. Minesweeper is back on Netflix. <laughs> it's very the same, but also not. <laughs> anyway, it's blowing up the Internet. Get it? Because Minesweeper. We'll talk about it. Stick around. <laughs> <laughs> you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Thanks to everybody who joins us live. And find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live if you'd like to join us live in the future. We're off tomorrow for the U.S. holiday, but we're back on Friday with Jason Howell and Len Peralta with us. Have a great holiday, everyone. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other. Understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>